Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these podcasts, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents St. Therese and Marie, the story of two cousins with Father Timothy Gallagher. Father Gallagher is a member of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, a religious community dedicated to retreats and spiritual formation, according to the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Father Gallagher is featured on several series on the EWTN television network, including Living the Discerning Life. He's the author of numerous books on the teachings of St. Ignatius of Loyola, as well as on the teachings of Venerable Bruno Lanteri, founder of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary. St. Therese and Marie, the story of two cousins with Father Timothy Gallagher. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Welcome back, Father Gallagher. Thanks, Chris. In our last conversation, you broke open an incredible letter for us that St. Therese had sent Marie. And I think that's, we've talked about this several times now, but the importance of these letters that we have access to, it really gives us a dimensionality, can we say it, that to the to the saint, in particular St. Therese, but now Marie. Well, that's true, I think, of all figures in history that we want to get to know. The letters are, in a sense, where you get the person in the most immediate, unstudied, authentic sort of way, you know. But that's really true in this case because we're dealing with families, and this was the way they communicated when they were not with each other. I'd say providentially for us, there were situations in which the family members were not with each other. When they were all at home in Lisieux, you didn't have letters. But when the Gerens would be on vacation in the summers and, and so forth, that's when you begin to get the letters. Well, this next letter, and this is from Marie to Therese, and this is six weeks after the letter that you just mentioned and that we quoted. So we're in 1889, and we're in the summer, and something new comes into the Garen family very shortly after Therese enters, the same year that uh, Therese enters the Carmel in 1888. And what happens is that a relative of Céline Garen, so Therese's aunt, Marie's mother, dies, and uh, he is a cousin of Céline's mother and a very wealthy man, and he leaves his inheritance to the Garens, and then also a a large property in the country, maybe about 45 miles east of Lisieux, uh, entitled the uh, Chateau de la Muse, M-U-S-S-E, which for the next 10 years is going to play a very important part in the story of the Martins and the Garens both. This is a complete change in the material of fortunes of the Garen family. From this point on, they're wealthy. And this, and let me, I'll get that out. This will also be the beginning of the, of Isidore as a special benefactor for the Carmel. The Carmel in Lisieux had, was very poor. It was poorly situated. It had very little revenue and they really struggled financially. And from this point on, now that Isidore has the means to do it, basically he's going to support the the Carmel and Lisieux whenever they're in urgent need, as they were from time to time. He, at this point, no longer needs to continue working as a pharmacist. He sells the pharmacy. The family moves to a different residence. There are a couple of temporary places where they stayed, including Les Buissonnets at, at uh, one point, the Martin family, for a short time. But eventually they have a new residence in Lisieux. And now they also have this Chateau de la Muse, which is about, if you look at a map, it's about maybe five miles east of the city of Evreux in in France. And it's a large property. There's a very large, that's the Chateau. It's it's a a very large summer resident, multi-story and very big. And what is beautiful is that it has a great deal of land connected with the property as well. So there are places to walk and there are large woods on the on the house, on the property. 
And the house itself is set slightly higher than the surrounding terrain. So in summer, it, it's very welcome for the families to go there and to have a little cooler place to be out in the country. Now, the the chateau is inherited together by the Garen family and the Morellon family because the mother in that family is a sister of Céline Garen. And what they work out is that they each have their own time to spend in the summer. So the Garen family will go there, let's say late May, and will stay through July, and then, or sometimes a little bit into August, and then the Maudalone family will take it and stay there through September or something like that. And this goes on for 10 years. It's also the reason why there are no more trips to the seashore after this, because now the vacation is no longer on the coast, but it is eastward to this Chateau de la Muse. And the families, of course, loved very beautiful place, and they loved it. Because they inherited it shortly after Therese enters, Therese never goes there. But this is a place which is very much a part of the Martin family hit story because after uh, Louis has to be uh, interned in the Bon Sauveur in Caen because of his mental illness, it's just not safe to have him out and about. The remaining Martin sisters, so that's Céline and Léonie, live with the Garens. And when, about four years later, what happens is that Louis's legs weaken to the point that he can't walk anymore. And from that point on, it's safe to have him back with the family. And so he does return, and he will spend his last years with his two daughters and the Garen family in Lisieux, and they will take him. It was not an easy thing to do um, because he wasn't mobile, but they would take him out to the chateau where he would spend the summers, and uh, he, he loved that out there. It's also where he will die in uh, one of those summers. He'll spend his final weeks there, and uh, you can all of this is available on photo if you go online or through the archives of the Carmel. You can see the I guess you, it's not quite a wheelchair. It's larger than that. It, it's built out of wood, and it can be mobile. It has handles so he can be moved, but it's larger than a wheelchair. He sort of reclines a little bit in it. After his death, that would be given to the Carmel, and Therese will spend her final months in that as well. So this is very much a part of the uh, of the family now, and we are in 1889, so this is the second year that the Garens have had the the Lamus, and Marie is writing to Therese, who again is in the Carmel at this point. So Marie is now 19, and Therese is 16. And the shift that we've seen from girlish letters, friends, and cousins that we've seen in the earlier years, uh, there's a remarkable shift, and it will just get more and more pronounced uh, as we go forward. So Marie writes, Your little Marie has obtained permission to write you, and her letter will not be read. What that means is, and this was just customary in the time, a mother would regularly read her daughter's letters before they were sent. And the same thing was true in religious life. When the sisters would write letters, the mother superior would read them. Occasionally, they'd be given permission to write without that oversight. And that's what's happened here. Marie knows that uh, no one else is going to see this letter, and she's really happy because it gives her freedom to write from her heart without restraint to Therese. So, your little Marie has obtained permission. I've said before, the little is an endearing word, and you'll see it all over the place, but that's uh, the reason for the repeated little. Your little Marie has obtained permission to write you, and her letter will not be read. I really see God's will here, for he wills me to seek consolation in the heart of my little Therese. If you only knew how I thank you for having wanted me to confide in Celine. Now what happens is that when Therese enters the Carmel, Marie no longer has the heart-to-heart access that she's had together until then with Therese. And she'll say it here, she's reduced to brief conversations, and the the visits are every two weeks, and only for a half hour, and she's generally not going to be alone, other family members, and Therese and some of her sisters, so it's very limited what she can say, although it still means a lot to her that she's able to do that. 
But uh, what happens is Marie is kind of suddenly doesn't have a place to turn. And she has this great weight, as we'll see immediately, of scruples and inner torments and sufferings, great, wonderful spiritual desires, but all of this heaviness of heart, and it's all bottled up within her. She has nowhere to go with it. And what happens is that we've mentioned earlier that the all of these girls were students at the Benedictine Abbey, the sisters, that's where they went to school. And the chaplain there was a Father Domain, D-O-M-I-N. And Marie retained him as her confessor after she left the abbey. And so we'll see her say in this letter that uh, she has, of course, poured out her heart and her burdens and her scruples to Father Domain, and he forbids her to share them with her sister Jeanne. And um, Marie is uncertain, and here you're already getting into the scruples, does that also mean that I'm forbidden to mention them to Celine? And she's really struggling and feeling alone. And in a preceding letter, Therese, or in a visit, we don't have it on record, but she says it here, Therese says, speak with Celine, speak openly. And Marie is deeply grateful to Therese for that. If you only knew how I thank you for having wanted me to confide in Celine, I obeyed you that same evening. So maybe she got a letter in which uh, Therese says, do it, and she didn't hesitate at all. And I opened my whole soul to her, and there isn't even a shadow hidden from her. I cast everything into her heart, and now my soul is an open book for her. What balm for my soul! I felt that I was understood, loved, and consoled. In a way, these are the heroic years in Celine's life, her Therese sister Celine, because she is the, the leading person handling the illness of their father and all that's involved with that. She, too, is bereft of Therese and feels that closeness that Therese describes in the story of a soul, the deep conversations, and and that's no longer available to her. She feels alone with all of this, and so much so that the prioress, Mother Marie de Gonzague, gives actually more than permission. She asks Therese to write regularly to Celine because she knows what those letters mean for Celine, which is another beautiful thing. That's why we have in these years many letters of Therese to Celine. But here too, Celine is kind of the strong figure that to whom Marie can turn. I felt that I was understood, loved, and consoled. I don't know how I was able to live thus far always withdrawn into myself not having anyone to whom I could confide my pains. And so you get an image of, of Marie here. I used to have to wait two weeks. So these are the visits in the uh, speak room at the Carmel. I used to have to wait two weeks for consolation from the Carmel, and then in a half hour I could only speak of what was most urgent. There are always some little sufferings in my heart, mere nothings, and I compare these to thorns, which, though they are little, wound one more deeply than the big thorns. Probably she's referring here to the, and she'll use the word, the torment of her scruples and, and troubles that probably no one else would even see, but which burdened her heart so much. I compare these to the thorns which, though they are little, wound one more deeply than big thorns. However, these troubles I don't have time to talk about and have to keep them to myself, that is, in these brief half-hour visits. Dear little sister, I'm going to tell you something that will really please you. And then she says, I am much less scrupulous. Well, <laughs> I'll, we'll, we'll let her continue to speak in the letter. But I'm sure she's very sincere when she says that. And she wants to us to know, I have interior problems I'm going to share, but I do want you to know that I'm not as scrupulous as I was. There is, however, a point on which I have been very much tormented. And that's the word she uses, tourmenté one in which I have been very much tormented, and not just tormented, but very much tormented. And we can already intuit what it's going to be if we go back to the last letter and all the suffering around purity as she sees the various Im- immodest things around her and how all of this troubles her so so heavily. It was on the eve of one of my... Excuse me. It was on the eve of one of my communions, and I feared... Or rather, I was sure that I had committed my sin. And then in parentheses, she writes, You understand, don't you? And I think it's very difficult to see this be something other than the struggles 
about purity that she's mentioned earlier to Therese. So it's the evening before she's going to go to communion. She's tormented. She's sure that she has sinned in this area. I found that I was not worthy to go to receive God. Now, I'll just uh, interject here because we do have Therese's answer to this letter. But you can already imagine how, how Therese is going to respond to this. You know, the more time I spend with Marie, the more it uh, seems to me that although obviously she has her own individual personality and struggles, but in a way, Marie is all of us. I mean, look at what this letter is about. This is not about we went to a party and I got a new dress and, and so forth. Everything here is her whole heart is centered on her spiritual life and her relationship with God and, and the Lord Jesus and communion. The Eucharist is so central to all of this. So there's a great goodness here, but there's also a fragility and a weakness and a self-doubt and a struggle. In a way, I think as we go through the relationship of Marie with Therese, and then Therese responds, she's responding to all of us. Uh, Marie is not, you know, a doctor of the church. She's not a canonized saint. She's not someone who went into the missions and was martyred. She's everyone, in a way, everyone who loves the Lord, really wants to be faithful to the Lord, but feels the burden of his or her own weakness and failures and struggles and fears of sinfulness and so forth. Uh, So she goes on, I found that I was not worthy to go to receive God, and I was not able to find Mama in order to have her share in my troubles which is very interesting, which tells us that one of the persons that Marie would turn to in these inner torments and struggles was her mother, Celine. Uh, But in this case, for whatever reason, her mother is just not available to her, so even that door is closed. And so I told Celine everything. And now a question. Was it right to tell Celine about struggles of this kind? Will I awaken a, a, a similar struggle somehow in Celine? So you get into the, 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 the circle of scrupulosity and you take a step and then you question the step and all of this is what's going on here. So she asked Therese, did I do well? I really don't know. That is, did I do well to tell Celine about all of this? I always gave sufficient reflections on this matter, so I thought a lot about whether I should talk to her or not about this. I feared that this may give some thoughts to Celine. You know, am I going to awaken a, a, a struggle in Celine having done this? I was thinking that perhaps I should not tell my sins to anyone. It's translated here to everybody, literally just to anyone. Excuse me. And then, since Monsieur l'Abbé Domain, so that's her confessor, had forbidden me to speak to Jean about my scruples, and I think that's very understandable. Uh, Jean is certainly not going to be competent to know what to do with this, and it's just going to create tensions. And then she wonders, does this prohibition also, was this prohibition perhaps for Celine also? So did I do wrongly to speak to Celine when perhaps my confessor was forbidding that? I'm not sure whether he did or not. So there's all the burden. Well, Therese, if you want to give me some advice on this matter, This will be one less great weight on my conscience. I don't want to leave you with the belief that I am gravely concerned. Oh no, I am very calm and am not over-worried. I don't know how you put all of that together, whether uh, others, in fact, things are a little better, although it's kind of hard to see that from what she's just written, or whether she just doesn't want Therese to be over-worried about this, which I would think is perhaps a little more likely, but hard to say. Could I interject sure. something? Do you mind if I mention something real quick? To that point, Father Gallagher, I maybe it's very presumptuous of me, but as a woman and a mom, I I know I've heard it from my own kids at certain times, and I may have even said it myself to ones I love. Something that's really bothering us, but then we'll say, don't worry, I've got it under control. But deep down, and that's why she's sharing it. And I think that's what's making it so real for everybody. I, you know, as you were reading that passage, I have to imagine that there are many souls out there who were maybe hearing it the same way I was as you're bringing this up because it truly is bothering you and you really do 
desire to have some help. Isn't that true of what we all go through? Like there, you always say it in the discernment of spirits. There's no shame here. There's no shame. Um, it, what would be sad is if you didn't turn to somebody and say, "I need, I need some, I need some guidance here." Well, I think that's why I say Marie is really everyone with different nuances, but. Who of us does not know that place deep down in our hearts in which there's a burden of this kind? Lord, you would like me to be here, so that's a higher place, but this is where I really am, and that's a lower place. Whatever the nuances are, I don't pray well, I waste time, I'm negligent to reach out to others, whatever the nuances of, of that are. And... With great reverence, yeah, that place is there in all of us. And the question is, what do we do with it? Actually, that will get us to the heart of Therese's little way, but I'll hold off on that because it's going to come as we go along. Is that weakness? Simply, are we condemned to it? And uh, we need to live our lives as best we can with that hidden place that's somewhat discouraged? Or can that very weakness become strength? Like uh, Paul says, you know, uh, it is when I am weak that I am strong. I rejoice in my weakness because then the that the, 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 the strength of Christ is in me. That actually is the whole heart of the little way. But that'll come a little bit later. But yeah, in that sense, Marie is all of us. And in just a few minutes, when we finish this letter, we'll let Therese respond to us. I think that's a pretty good way to see it, that Marie is burdened, but she and so she is reaching out. But she doesn't want Therese to get over-worried either. On the other side of that, too, it really says a lot about Therese, doesn't it? I mean, that people, especially uh, as you recall, that Marie is older than Therese. And yet she turns to her almost like a mother figure uh, to be uh, that maternal nurturing that seems to, and I say this in all reverence, it oozes out of Therese. That she would feel, I, I want you to know I'm okay, but there's the verbal eraser, you know, everything that comes before it. But here's what I've been experiencing. What are your thoughts? Yes, you know, as you said other times, you really can't view Therese in light of her biological, chronological age. She's 16 at this point, and now she's not where she will be in another five years or so, but she's no longer that young girl who is simply a good friend and and a first cousin who has her own struggles, you know, emotionally and so forth. She's in a very different place already at this point. It's a year after she's entered the Carmel. And the early stages of what will become really heroic sanctity are already here. And, you know, it, it also strikes me as we go through these letters, and you make that comment, that Marie seems intuitively to know this. She's not anywhere saying, well, you're younger, so I shouldn't be reaching out to you. But she senses intuitively the spiritual depth in Therese, and she knows that in reaching out to Therese, she's reaching out for what will be very solid and grounded and helpful advice. So you get that from from Marie. She's one of the first to sense this in Therese. Well, she goes on. I don't want to leave you with the belief that I am gravely concerned. Oh no, I am very calm and I am not over-worried. But it's just that I'll be very happy to have your approval. Did I do well to speak to Celine and so forth about all of this? Beloved little sister, you may write me without any fear, for your letter will be for me alone. So she also has this guarantee that Therese's letter will not be read by another. And then she says, oh, how I love you, and she has three exclamation points there. Allow me to tell you this. It gives such consolation to my heart. And then there's a little bit of self-reflection here. Oh, yes, I have a heart that I feel only too much. It has too much ardor. When it loves, its love has no limits. At times I feel that my body is too narrow to contain it. There is between us an affection that isn't of this earth. We are united through the bonds of the soul. How sweet this affection is. Nothing can describe it. And the word sister, which is nevertheless one of the sweetest names, is not the expression we must use. Now there you get a a very central trait in Marie. 
this uh, overflowing, abundant, ardent, effervescent pouring out of herself uh, on a heart level, whether in joy or in love, but also in struggle and in sorrow. And Marie knows this about herself. Uh, My heart has too much ardor. When it loves, its love has no limits. And uh, she just has to pour herself out this way. This, you know, you can put yourself in Therese's position receiving this, I would say, very sincere and ardent, but over ardent, needy kind of pouring out of her heart to Therese in this way. And Therese will have to find a way to respond to this. This is so much so, I think we'll see it later on, that there's a, there's a point when Marie is writing a letter to Therese, and she's on her fourth page at this point. And Celine is also her, Therese's sister Celine is also with her in the room. And Marie will say later on in the letter, well, I better stop now because Marie, you know, there's thunder in her eyes as she's watching how long this letter is getting. Probably because Celine knows that it's in a sense putting a burden on Therese to have to absorb all of this and then respond to it. So you get that quality in Marie. Uh, How's Therese going to respond to that? We'll be getting to that very shortly. But I'll, I'll say if there are burdens and limitations in this kind of ardor, there's also a great gift in it. I mean, a heart that can deeply, deeply give itself in love. It will need maturation, but there is a very beautiful and rich core there. So much so that later on, toward the end of, in her last months, Therese will really surprise Marie by saying, God wants you to become a saint. You can become like I am. So there are two of us, and you can be what will no longer be present after my death. Just, it's striking to see Therese saying this to Marie later on. Well, yes, Therese, God is pleased to break my heart. When he wills to make me suffer, it is always to my heart that he turns My lot is interior suffering. So the family is well-to-do. They're in a wonderful place for the summer. She has everything. She has a lovely family. She always has ongoing physical things, but there's nothing major at this point. So when God draws her on the path of suffering, it's on this heart level, she says, that that God calls her to, to walk. At times I feel as though I am abandoned. I am experiencing a deadly ennui, weariness, fatigue. You should not believe I love life. No, I'm meeting only with disappointments, deception in the Spanish, and she doesn't specify what that is. All we could do is speculate there. Is there something that she hopes for, someone she reaches out to in some way, looking for friendship, or but she doesn't specify. And then she says, there are some persons who would be in their glory if they had a chateau. If they had a property like this to live in and and these surroundings, and if they had all they desired, let them come then to my place. I'll grant it to them gladly. As for myself, there is no place where I'd be happier than at Le Buissonnet. And this was the the period in which the Garenne family was briefly living at Le Buissonnet. So if I were back home in Lisieux, that's where I'd be happiest. I don't need any of this. I'd like you to recommend my vocation to God. Pray especially for this. So, here we get a window into the fact that Marie is very much considering a vocation to the Carmel. And she's not sure about this yes, but she's yet. She's not sure about this yet, but she's feeling the attraction. I will continue here for a moment and then come back to this. So she says, pray especially for this. I can see that I'm not at the end of my sufferings. If God wills to catch me in his nets, as you have already told me in a preceding letter, I would throw myself into them with love. I have only one fear, to be mistaken. So Marie is very much drawn to a vocation in the Carmel, but she is still very hesitant about this. She's not sure whether God is calling her. And in fact, her parents have some hesitations about this as does Jeanne, because they know her ardent, impulsive nature, and they're afraid that she would join Carmel more out of impulse than out of a deeply reasoned and very sure vocation. So they're not at all sure that she really is called to the Carmel. So that's where she is with this. She's 19 years old. 
which is approaching adulthood in, in the culture of the day. Many are already married at this time. Feeling drawn but unsure. Well, we'll anticipate just a moment here because it's a, a little over a year later. So this is September 24th, 1890 which is the day that Therese takes the veil. So the way this worked in the Carmel was when a, a, a sister had finished postulancy and novitiate and was approved for final vows, the final vow ceremony was private. It was in the choir area within the cloister. So all the sisters would be there, the prioress would preside, and the sister would profess her final vows. But then, then there was a public ceremony which would take place maybe a few weeks later. And this is the taking of the veil that we're referring to here. So if you look at the photos, as a postulant and a novice, Therese has a white veil. And the outward sign of perpetual profession was the supplying for that of the black veil, which completed the entire habit of the Carmel. And this was done in public in the Carmel Chapel. And it was very significant because it was the last time uh, in their lives that these sisters would actually have contact with their families so they could come there and be part of the ceremony. And, of course, the, the chapel was outside the cloister, so this, this was, of course, it, it was really significant in its spiritual meaning, but it was also a very powerful moment because, again, it would be the last time that there wouldn't be a grill between the sister and her family. For Therese, this day is, she describes it in her story of a soul, the day of taking the veil, she says, was a day veiled in tears. And it was in tears, in fact, so much so that, well, I'll just read what she says in the story of a soul here. And then we'll see very quickly the importance of this for Marie. The ceremony of my reception of the veil took place on the 24th of September, and the day was veiled in tears. Parenthetically, that's just lovely writing. Reception of the veil, the day was veiled in tears. And the reason for the tears. Papa was not there to bless his queen. This would have been the last time that she could have seen her father. And he was so ill at this point that they were afraid to have him at the ceremony because they were afraid that the emotion of it would cause some kind of serious worsening of his situation. So uh, there was a lot of consideration to this, and finally they just said, we can't take that risk. And so our, her father was not there. Father Pichon was in Canada, so he is her spiritual director, Father Pichon, the Jesuit. He's in Canada, uh, where he spent many years in the missions there. The bishop, who was supposed to come and dine with uncle, did not come at all because he was sick. So all the, the significant people that she would have loved to have there, none of them were there. And, well, we'll just let her say it. In a word, everything was sadness and bitterness. But then this is Therese, and still peace, underlined, always peace, reigned at the bottom of the chalice. That day, too, Jesus permitted that I was unable to hold back my tears, and these were misunderstood. In fact, I had been able to bear up under much greater crosses without crying. However, this was because I was helped by powerful graces. Jesus left me to my own resources on the 24th, and I soon showed how little these resources really were. And in fact, Pauline kind of scolds her for this, for the tears, you know, if this is what the Lord wants. And you know that if Father were here, things you might have something much more serious to have tears about, etc., uh, now, it's that day and in that ceremony at which Marie is present when she resolves her vocational doubts. And from that ceremony, that day, Marie is sure that God is calling her to be a Carmelite. Now, we're advancing a little bit ahead there, but just to complete what we've seen Marie say here, that she's thinking about a Carmelite vocation and she asks for prayers for it at this point. Trials are beginning, and they haven't ended. I don't see the future with a happy outlook. I am passing through a moment of great loathing, and I haven't the courage for anything. I used to desire so much to receive communion more than twice a week, which is unheard of at that time when so many limited themselves to the Easter duty, you know, once a year. Uh, and as, as they say, we, we've seen and we will see increasingly this thread of Marie and the Eucharist. It's so central for her. 
And this week, when this was granted to me, so she has permission to receive communion more than twice this week, I am finding no taste whatsoever for communion. I shall even say that my thanksgivings could not be more arid. Dear little sister, I recommend myself to your prayers, and I tell you that I love you with all my heart. Kiss your sisters for me. Offer my respects to Mother Marie de Gonzague and Mother Genevieve, and then she simply signs Marie. Four days later, Therese replies, My dear little sister, since you have the humility to ask advice from your little Therese, she cannot refuse you. But the poor little novice, Therese is a novice at this point, without any experience, would fear making a mistake, and you yourself could have some doubts about what she tells you. No, there's there's a laser-like understanding here of Marie's situation and what she's going to need uh, what to, uh, from Therese so that what Therese says will really meet the need and not leave her, yes, but, you know, uh, with that kind of thing. Okay, it's humble of you to ask advice from a little novice, doesn't have an awful lot of mis- experience, who could make a mistake and could leave you and what she writes with some doubts about whether this was really the the true answer to it or not. Okay, so that's the situation. So how do I deal with that? But today, have no fear. This is the answer of Jesus himself that I am bringing you. Oh, how happy I am to transmit it to you. Well, how does she know what Jesus' answer uh, is? This morning, I asked our good mother, so that's Mother Marie de Gonzague, the prioress. This morning, I asked our good mother what I should answer you regarding what you said to Céline. In doing what this dear mother told me for you, you will have no fear of making a mistake. For God has placed in her heart a deep knowledge of souls and all their miseries. She knows all, Therese underlines the word all, nothing, underlined, is hidden from her. Your little soul is perfectly known by her. And in fact, there is a relationship already between Marie and Mother Marie de Gonzague. Marie always loved this prioress very deeply. I always had great confidence in her. So Therese is doing two things here. By turning to the superior, she has the weight of authority, and then she has the weight of authority of one that Marie personally knows and loves and trusts. Okay, and she tells Marie, the prioress knows everything, nothing's hidden, she knows you perfectly. This is what she told me to tell you from Jesus, underlined from Jesus. You did very well, and that's all underlined. You did very well. You did very well to tell Celine everything. So that's the first thing, all right? With the authority of a religious superior and one who knows you deeply and has deep experience in the spiritual life, I want you to know that you did not only well, but you did very well to speak openly with Celine. Okay, having said that, however, it is better not to converse about these things. Okay, that's not the solution, and anyone who's struggled with scruples knows how sound this advice is. The more you think about it and talk about it and try to figure it out and delve into it just the deeper the heaviness becomes. That's not the way to deal with scruples. What is the way to deal with scruples? It is better not to converse about these things. It is better to pay no attention whatsoever to them, and that's the key. This burden is arising, and I'm wondering, just stop it. Don't even go there. End that. Turn your thoughts to something else. Pray, whatever it is, but do not get into that vortex. It is better to pay no attention whatsoever to them, for our mother is sure that you are doing no wrong. So, are you reassured? Question mark. It seems to me that in your place, if she, the prioress, had said as much to me, I would have been cured, and I would have allowed myself to be led blindly, for this is the only way to have any peace. And and when a person with reverence, you know, when a person is deeply burdened with scruples, uh, this is, as Therese says, the best way to come out of that quagmire is to speak with a competent spiritual, to speak with a competent spiritual person, and then simply absolutely, without question, follow the counsel that you are given. I remember a conversation once about scruples, and there was a man there who was was recounting an earlier experience when at a certain point, with very goodwill, 
he had found himself very troubled by whether he had kept the Eucharistic fast or not, you know, for that hour before reception, and whether this little thing or that little thing might have broken the fast, and just very troubled by all of this. And he said he went to a confessor who said, do you keep food with you? Do you keep food in your room? Not usually. Uh, okay, then unless you go into the kitchen, you go to communion. You know, it, it very simple, very basic, and it was what he needed, and it got him through it. That's a, kind of what Therese is saying here to to Marie. Look, you have an authoritative person who absolutely knows everything about this in you and can assure you that you did well with this, and your path with this is simply not even to get into these wonderings and thoughts and confusions and did I and might I. You just pay no attention to that and now blindly follow that advice. That's the only way for you to get through this. Not only that, for this is the only way to have any peace and especially to please Jesus. Then she ups the ante. Even if you were certain of doing something wrong, there is still no danger. For our mother, and that's a lovely thing, our mother, you know, uh, Marie is not in the Carmel with her, but she is in a very real way, spiritually, Marie's mother. Therese does these things so naturally, almost, I would say, these little touches that lift the heart of her recipient. She knows them so well, and she'll, well, we'll see some more of these as we go along. So there is still no danger for our mother who has, and I really like this, who has, and then in parentheses, I think, close parentheses, more experience than you, and she underlines you, so that's a lovely thing, is telling you that you haven't done any wrong. Now, what about that ardent heart that Marie sees as a weakness and a liability? Oh, Marie, how fortunate you are to have a heart that can love, and she underlines love, how fortunate you are to have a heart that can love in this way. Thank Jesus for having given you such a precious gift. So this is another thing you'll always see in Therese. For Marie, this ardent heart is simply a burden. Oh, no. And Therese flips that around. What a wonderful thing that God has given you a heart that can love so much. And thank him that he's given you such a precious gift. And then live with it. And she says, thank Jesus for having given you such a precious gift. And give him your heart totally. And she underlines the word totally. Now, what follows here is something that is deep in Therese. Uh, you see it in the other sisters, too. It's very, it's very deep in Therese. Creatures are too little to fill the immense void. And she underlines those words, immense void. Creatures, uh, when she uses that word creature, she means human beings, basically. It also means possessions and things of that sort. But primarily, it means human persons. Creatures are too little to fill the immense void that Jesus has dug out. I don't quite like the translation there, but it's accurate in the sense. But what it is, is Jesus has emptied, has hollowed out an immense void in your heart that no human person can ever completely fill. And that's true of all of us. What a profound, you know, Augustine's famous, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Thomas Aquinas, in one of his lovely commentaries on the Creed, has this lovely sentence in three words, solus deus sufficit, God alone suffices. So this is true not only of the religious, but it's true in every vocation. And this, this is very, very deep in Therese's awareness. Creatures are too little to fill the immense void that Jesus has dug out in your heart. Don't give them any place in your soul. God will not catch you in his nets. Oh, this is a beautiful thing. Remember, we've just heard, Marie, about her vocation. You know, if God wants me in his nets, and if I knew it, then I would follow immediately. God will not catch you in his nets, for you are already imprisoned within them. And I think you have to say that about Marie. You know, as you get to know her, it's hard to see any other vocation taking shape than the vocation to a religious life and very much to the contemplative life. We'll see more about that. Yes, it is really true that our affection is not of this earth. It is too strong for that. Even death would not be capable of breaking it. Another thing that's very deep in Therese and the Martin family consciousness, her father in a very beautiful way, that 
when we love in Jesus, our love never ends. Death can, can do nothing. Death, in fact, opens up the possibility of a deeper love. And so th- th- this, this perspective of heaven, of eternal life, underlies everything in Therese and in this whole conversation. What if we had that, I think, sometimes? But I will say that in the years that I've been dealing this deeply with Therese and the family story, it's one of the things I'm very grateful for because you are constantly, almost every page, you're brought back to heaven. This passes. What we have here passes. Heaven is the our home port. It's our lasting city. And what matters is to live this life so that we can have that eternity of joy. And with God, but also in the, within this family, there's a deep consciousness of we will be together forever as a family. And there won't be any more tears there. We'll be together with joy. Don't be troubled. Okay, what about the communions? And they're so arid and her thanksgivings feel so barren. Don't be troubled about feeling no consolation in your communion. So this is the whole message to her. Don't be troubled. Okay, there's such goodness that God has has placed in you, and don't be troubled. Don't be troubled about feeling no consolation in your communions. This is a trial that you must bear with love. Therese speaks out of her own experience, too, because she'll say in the story of the soul how often arid her own thanksgivings were as well in the Carmel. And then she says, okay, this this is like the overture to an opera where you're already seeing the main themes, you know, displayed briefly and they're all going to return. So don't be troubled about feeling no consolation in your communions. This is a trial that you must bear with love. Don't lose any of the thorns, underlined that word. Don't lose any of the thorns. You remember how Marie spoke of the little thorns that she carries? Don't lose any of the thorns you are meeting every day. Well, what do you mean, don't lose them? How should I live them? Or, you know, what, what is the, the, the way to respond to these struggles, that, little struggles that are a part of every day? Don't lose any of the thorns you are meeting every day. With one of them, you can save a soul. And she underlines, save a soul, and exclamation point. So th- this is getting us also, <clears throat> excuse me, this is such another deep part in Therese that our willingness, she often uses the word sacrifices. You know, we don't, we hold back that angry response to something that someone has said. We offer to help a person who is difficult for us. We give this person time who maybe isn't using our time entirely well and when we have other urgent things to do and so forth. All of these little things, this is the the little way, you know, and, and love in these little things. And it's deep in her awareness that even one of these little things may mean the difference between eternal loss or eternal heaven for a soul. So how, how rich with meaning and how important our response to everything, every don't, don't lose one of them. Because your willingness to be patient with this person or to accompany that person who asks you to go on something that you don't really feel drawn to, or whatever whatever the circumstances are in daily living, we all have them. Don't lose any of them because your response and willingness to bear with that thorn or make that sacrifice may mean another person eternally in heaven. And this is in the communion of saints, you know, it's in, in the church and the sharing of graces. This just comes to mind. There's a point later when Therese is now assist, she's assistant novice mistress, and Marie of the Trinity comes in, who is the first member of the community younger than Therese, and Therese is bringing her into religious life. And Marie had her, uh, of the Trinity had her struggles. She had tried earlier to join the Carmel in Paris and had a had had to come home. This was the second try. Probably without Teresa's guidance, she wouldn't have made it this time either. But at one point, she is walking across the cloister area, the, the courtyard area, and just sort of slowly taking her time. And Therese sees her. And she says, oh, oh no, oh no. Is that the way you help your children? Don't waste time. Perform the task that's been given to you. And underlying all of this, your children, is you can make the difference by how you 
carry out this task, you know, with your heart and, and without negligence and so forth, that may make you can save a soul with that, contribute to a person's eternal salvation. So that's what she's saying here to Marie. Again, we're still at the earlier stages of this in Therese, but these are very deep things and they're only going to get deeper as the next years go by. Uh, if you only knew how much God is offended, just looking at the world and how careless people are of God and how resistant. And then she says to Marie, your soul is so well made for consoling him. Love him to folly. And she underlines folly. Love him to folly for all those who don't love him. And then she's concluding the letter now. Uh, let me see. This is uh, She's writing on a Sunday. Sunday was the one day that was relatively free for the sisters. And so you get these letters either in that 8 p.m. time that during the, the week at the end of the day or on Sunday. So this is a Sunday when she's writing. Little sister, after its foolish race, my pen must stop. So Therese here, this is not studied. She's just, she's just writing, and all the more for the reason that follows. I have five letters to write today. One of those was to Celine. The editors note that. One of them may have been to her father at the, in the institution in Caen. So she has uh, five letters to write, but then uh, watch what she says to Marie here. Little sister, after its foolish race, my pen must stop. I have five letters to write today, but I began with my little Marie. I, you, you're first. I love her so much, that is you, Marie, and so unselfishly. This is another place where, um, where the French is slightly different. Um, so, je l'aime tant. I, I love her, you so much, et, et si peu naturellement, and so little. It's translated here unselfishly, and maybe that's the best way to say it. But um, there's a nuance in here, I think, of it's not on the natural level. Uh, now, you can see in Marie, it, of course it is, it's rich with humanity and friendship and, and the cousins and all that, but that's not the deep thing here. The deep thing is on a deep spiritual level that, that she loves her in this way. You can see Marie is not quite there yet. There, she's still needy. Um, let's see. She's still more needy, you know, at this point. I really wish we had Marie's response to this letter. Uh, if she did write when it's not conserved, I think very likely this is in July, in the summer. Probably what happens is that not too long after the family returns to Lisieux, and so the letters stop because now they can have the visits in the, in the speak room. Father Gallagher, as you were describing the instruction, of, literally, of Therese to Marie, that in a very real way, it incorporates the will, that it's not something that we necessarily want to do or is easy to do, but we need to do. And so it incorporates the will. So when she is said, the, the, mother's, the mother superior, the mother has said, this is what you're going through, that it's okay. Now you need to let it go. That for Marie, Therese is kind of almost insisting, you're going to have to work at this. You're going to have to let, when it comes up, you got to let it go. And for a lot of us, that, that can be very challenging. I'm sure it was for Marie because this is coming from a place of emotion. This is coming from a, a different location in us, and we, you want to dwell on it, but no, I cannot. I need to let this go. And it's an act of the will, isn't it? Very much so, but made much easier by the clarity and the authority of the council. You know, without that, let's say she just speaks with someone who is, you know, no further along than she in the, in the spiritual life, it's probably not going to help. And you can see Therese is so on point with this, and she very much clarifies the authority with which the council is given and the and the council itself is very simple and very clear and even if you're convinced that you've sinned you still do this and you follow this blindly yes it's going to take some effort of will but habits grow by exercise every time marie does this the easier it's going to get i don't want to anticipate too much but um as we get to the later years in Marie's life, we will find that the this kind of, of scruple and torment fades. And in fact, so much so that we'll see here, this is after Therese's death, becoming in her turn the person who is giving this kind of counsel. 
This is to Céline Maudelonde, Marie's first cousin, and you've seen Therese mention her. She was part of the of the group of these girls as they played together growing up. And Céline has these very much the same kinds of struggles, and we'll see, as her biographer at one point says, sometimes you'd think it was Therese writing. You know, Marie has really deeply absorbed this and now becomes a channel of this to others. And that's a beautiful thing for all of us because we're not condemned to remain in these torments and inner doubts and struggles and quagmires. That There's a way out, and Marie will walk that way out uh, with some struggles along the way, but she'll certainly walk that way as the years go by. So for any of us who might be writing that same letter to Therese as Marie, whatever the situation might be, we should take heed of her counsel where we're at to seek out that wise spiritual counsel. And as you just mentioned, it's not necessarily just the friend or even the family member, though they may be very loving and caring towards us. They may not necessarily exhibit that wise spiritual counsel that's been tested through time. So they, you may find it in your parish. You may find it in a coworker or someone else. But it's, it's important to, to really discern who would be the best person to go to. Well, we, yeah, absolutely. And now we can be accompanied on all kinds of levels. And Marie has, you know, her mother, we've seen she'll turn to her and, and other people in her life. She's not isolated But if it's a question of advice, basically this is a question of spiritual direction, then you want a competent, wise, spiritual person who will understand the issue and can speak clearly to it. And that kind of counsel can do wonders, you know, for for getting you through it. Okay, thanks. I just wanted that for that person out there. Now Therese is teaching us through you. You've been listening to St. Therese and Marie, the story of two cousins with Father Timothy Gallagher. Be sure to check out the comprehensive summary and reflection questions contained in the show notes for this episode. To download this particular episode, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find them within the free Discerning Hearts app or wherever you download your favorite podcasts. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, please consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for St. Therese and Marie, the story of two cousins, with Father Timothy Gallagher.